Hello, and a warm welcome back to the Harvard Humanitarian Assistance Podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Blake, and with me in the studio today is Dr. Jocelyn Kelly, the director of the Gender Rights and Resilience Program, or GR2, as we call it here at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which is also referred to as HHI, so I'm giving you all the acronyms up front. Jocelyn is the founding director of the GR2 program and is currently a fellow at HHI, where she designs and implements projects examining issues related to gender, peace, and security. She's been conducting research in conflict zones for over a decade, with a focus on understanding and preventing gender-based violence in these contexts. Full disclosure before we begin, I am also the research coordinator of the GR2 program, so I know Jocelyn fairly well and have worked with her closely. And that's one of the reasons why I was so excited to get back into the studio to share with you a little bit about the program itself and some of our upcoming projects. Jocelyn, thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. A little context before we begin. We actually recorded this episode of the podcast back in February with the intention of releasing it in March for Women's History Month. But as we all know, March 2020 did not go according to really anyone's expectations. And with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to hold back on releasing this episode. Last week, Jocelyn and I recorded an additional conversation discussing COVID-19 and some of the gendered implications of this crisis. So what you're about to hear is first the conversation we recorded back in February, where we discuss a little bit about the GR2 program and the work we were doing. And this conversation is followed by an additional COVID-19 focused update. A lot of our listeners probably don't know, but you actually split your time between Washington, D.C. and Cambridge, where Harvard is based, um, as well as spending a lot of time in DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where a lot of our research takes place. Um, So it is actually genuinely exciting for us to be in the same place recording this podcast conversation. I couldn't agree more. So to start off, why don't we talk a little bit about the origin story of the Gender Rights and Resilience Program? What drove you to this work? What were some of the dynamics you were observing in the humanitarian sector at the time that kind of made you think there was a need for a program that could provide this type of analysis on the many gendered dimensions of you know, conflict and fragile contexts? Yeah, it's a great question. So I actually um, came into grad school having done emergency response in Hurricane Katrina. And um, during the time I spent in New Orleans kind of uh, responding with the U.S. government and with state governments to this really unprecedented disaster, I remember being really struck by the extent to which incredibly smart, well-intentioned, thoughtful people could still not get disaster response right. And I think I went into the Katrina response feeling like surely we have this figured out with this many government agencies, with this many people trying to help. Um, We must have best practices. And I think I was really startled by seeing how much um, kind of emergency response, at least in Katrina, was driven by um, a sense of um, panic or, you know, where people wouldn't always have the time to think through the long-term consequences of the decisions they made. And that really drove me to want to come to the Harvard School of Public Health and complete my master's in um, uh, health and human rights. And from there, I was sure I wanted to go on and do programming. You know, I think it's everyone's dream to really make a difference in in the lives of people affected by conflict and crisis. And I thought that programming was definitely the most direct path to do that. Um, and I was really surprised by how much I fell in love with the research. So during my first and second, between my first and second year of grad school, I was um, asked to go to Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo with the International Medical Corps. And um, very much to their credit, IMC was trying to figure out the needs of women who'd been affected by conflict-related sexual violence um, so they could better uh, design their programming. And the way that they wanted to do that was by naturally speaking to the women themselves. And that was the project I was tasked uh, with. And I think through the process of talking to these incredible women, of learning the fact that um, the stated needs and desires of these survivors were not always what the international community assumed. 
it was this incredible awakening and it kind of set me on this journey of realizing how much more systematicity, how much more evidence um, we can bring into the field of humanitarian response and perhaps most importantly, perhaps our um, biggest value added is systematically gathering information from the experts who are in fact the affected populations. And chances are, if you are listening to this podcast, you've been following us a little bit as we've changed the name of the program over the last month. So I wondered if we could chat a little bit about this new name, previously the Women in War program, now the Gender Rights and Resilience or GR2 program. Um, why do you think this is a more appropriate name? Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to make this change and kind of comment on what this, you know, the new scope that this represents? Yeah, it's such a great question. And um, thanks to all the people who helped us kind of reimagine this name by putting keywords on post-it notes and rearranging them around the office with us at Open House. Um, so a lot of really wonderful, thoughtful people contributed to the long-term thought process that uh, resulted in the name change. Basically, the Women in War program, in so many ways, the name and what we did was so near and dear to my heart. I worked um, on the Women in War program for over a decade. Um, but as time went on, I don't think our core values have changed. Um, but the name itself felt like it wasn't expressing the nuance the agency, and the kind of multidimensionality of our work. So um, as you can imagine, Women in War um, kind of emphasizes the women's issues sides of things, which is really so fundamental and core to our identity. But a lot of the time, the way that we try to better understand women's issues is by ensuring that we triangulate in on an issue by talking to community leaders, service providers, men and boys, and to really triangulate in on information that affects women by talking to multiple stakeholders. As we all know, um, the gender dimension of violence and the gender dimension of crisis is um, extraordinarily complex and things that affect women um, come from, you know, both male and female perspectives. And I think to bring gender into the title much more accurately reflects that. Um, as you also know, we do a lot of work talking to um, armed actors and potential perpetrators of violence. And so um, that's a great example of how you would talk to actors who are not women to better understand issues that affect women. So that, I think, addresses part of the first bit of the name. And then for the Women in War program, you know, certainly it has a nice alliteration. It's very catchy. But we work in so many contexts so far beyond war itself. And one of the really um, exciting issues that I think we're beginning to understand better is how women interact with their natural environment and with conservation. Um, and that is becoming increasingly pressing as climate change becomes a bigger and bigger issues, particularly in these places. And so by moving to gender rights and resilience, we really are looking at um, broadening the kind of context that we say that we work in, and then also emphasizing not only vulnerabilities, but strengths that can occur in those contexts. And that's a great teaser for some of the new content that we have yeah. coming out over the month of March. We'll be talking a little bit more about some of these new elements to the program, particularly on the climate change conservation environment note. And, you know, it's really exciting to kind of be able to integrate these two concepts during at such an important time. I couldn't agree more. Stay tuned, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe if you could comment also um, briefly on why having a gender perspective on conflict or, or fragile context or peace processes is important in terms of what you might miss if you're not kind of taking into account all of these different perspectives and doing the analysis with a gendered lens? Uh, that's such an incredible question. And, um, you know, my mind immediately goes to two particular examples from my work. One was we were talking to survivors of violence in Pansy Hospital in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. And Dr. McQuiggy, the director of that hospital, as many of you know, won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and he's just a kind of remarkable hero in this field. But um, working at Pansy, we were talking to female survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. And um, 
I think I mentioned earlier, a lot of times when you actually talk to people affected by an issue, they're highlighting things that you really wouldn't have thought of because you're not living their reality. And so they would say, um, you know, a lot of times, especially when you're a service provider, you think medicine is the most important thing. And women were saying, you know, actually, our biggest need is education for our children. So they're never um, thrown into the cycles of vulnerability that brought me um to be as vulnerable as I was to the sexual violence I faced. And so there's these very poignant findings that made you realize that you didn't have the full picture until you talked to, to women. And the other thing that they were noting, which was really shocking and I think has always been hard for people to understand, is that when they were um, victims of rape, especially from soldiers and especially in kind of more public context during an attack on a village, a lot of these women were then actually ostracized and kicked out of their own families or kicked out of their own communities because of the stigma associated with being a rape survivor. And it's kind of mind-boggling to think about why that would be since it's so clearly an act that the women um, were forced into. And so this idea of the stigma and the isolation of survivors became all-consuming because once a woman was kicked out of her family and community, then she basically was thrown into these horrific, hyper-vulnerable states where she would face continuing violence, you know, living on the street, trying to take care of her children. So we um, decided to talk to male relatives about why they would make the choice to isolate a woman in this way, whether that was a wife, a sister, a mother. And... Um, we kind of sent out word to male family members of survivors that would like to talk to them. And we um, showed up the first day and there was this line literally around the hospital, like lining the walls wow. of the hospital of men just waiting to tell their side of the story. And it was so remarkable. In the first focus group we had, we had to cut it at four hours because the groups are only supposed to be an hour and change. Otherwise, people get tired. So we cut it at four hours and tried to bring in the next group. And the guys from the first group kept trying to get back in. And they were like, we haven't finished talking about oh, wow. what's happened to us. And I think one of the most incredibly kind of shocking and heartbreaking things that came out of those discussions that highlighted the importance of understanding gender dimensions is that in so many cases, the men said, um, we're so ashamed and traumatized about what happened to this woman in our family that we can't stand to look at her knowing our own failure. And they also said kind of from a male perspective in cases especially of a husband and wife, the husband felt that his one and only job was to have protected his wife from sexual violence. And if he failed at that job, the marriage was kind of dissolute. You know, it was the contract was broken. There's no marriage left. And the women said, um, we never expected you to protect us. but We're asking you to, like, support us now. And to see the difference in those perspectives was just so heartbreaking and that in some cases the isolation or the ostracism from women came from a place of just such trauma and shame and horror from the men rather than a place of callousness right and so um from having done that project we were working with a local congolese organization that gave psychosocial support and as a result of those discussions they actually started doing holistic therapy so instead of just talking to women about helping them recover from the attack. They started counseling the husbands both alone and as a couple or, you know, brothers or fathers as well. And they said that approach really helped them move on. So I think that's my favorite kind of vignette showing the importance of understanding the gender dimensions. Oh, that's incredible. And I feel like that really speaks to exactly why the name change was so important, that you're really not getting this holistic picture if you're not talking to all parties involved if you're not really there to understand the social contextual implications and yeah. really personal things that are, are difficult to speak about in any context, but particularly in these heightened, exacerbated situations of, of conflict. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in a lot of cases, the men were so ashamed that they never talked to other men as mm -hmm. well about that experience. And I think that was kind of an opportunity for them that we then leveraged in more fo formal programming through the psychosocial NGO. That's great. And I think um, that also speaks a little bit to, 
I wanted to mention, just in case people are not already following us on Instagram and Twitter, that you recently came back from a trip to DRC in which you highlighted work that you were doing with invisible children and local collaborators on the ground um, and kind of touching on what you were just saying about being able to like use research to inform people who are practitioners who are experts in trauma and psychosocial support, um, kind of painting a holistic view of what this work looks like on the ground. Um, I think our team was really struck by some of the photos and the video footage that you were able to get that you were sending back that painted a very real picture of what this work looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, that there's a real human element that comes from working across languages and cultures and contexts, but there's also the like, you need printouts and basic day-to-day, -day, you know, laptop work that is also happening. Um, could you speak a little bit about this recent trip, um, how you view GR2's work kind of fitting into the broader context of humanitarian and human rights work that's kind of already being done. Yes. And to start um, maybe with a more focused example, like we named the printer that we were working with um, on this past trip because it became such a member of the team. <laughs> <laughs> we had to do all these printouts and, you know, the power wasn't always on. And we ended up just as a team gathering around the printer and like cheering for it oh to God. make it through all the handouts kind of like you can do it and every morning we'd go in there and kind of like pet it and be like you can do it today printer um I've be always said if I ever have like any like kind of travel incident or danger that I might be put in on any like trip is going to be related to a printer right like it's not an exciting story it's not a story that you can like tell often and people are like wow that was a crazy trip you took it's the 12 hours I spent trying to get a printer to work <laughs> maybe we'll have to put this on Instagram but one of my favorite moments that I actually tracked because there was something so wonderfully like this is what life is like when you're doing work um and research in remote field sites we needed a copy of a description of our research and we'd been handing them out and we were down to our last page and a community leader wanted to stay you know have a copy for himself so we in the middle of nowhere is actually <laughs> close to what is called the pole of inaccessibility uh -huh. in africa so <laughs> so convenient aptly named um we decided we need to make a printout and so we found someone who had this like old probably one of the first printers ever made and we had to first go and buy like three teaspoons of gasoline oh we got some gasoline put it in a um like compressor and someone had to hand crank oh wow hand crank the <laughs> compressor for it to start and then the printer like slowly came to life while this guy's like furiously cranking and we made our one copy and like to me, that's one of my favorite things to have captured on video <laughs> because I'm like, yes, certainly there's some flights and there's some really beautiful sunsets and you definitely drive on these incredible roads. But so much of it is just hoping that a printer is going to come really, through for you. <laughs> just really need that printer um, to work. We'll have to put that on the <laughs> on the Instagram because for our listeners who can't see the hand motions that Jocelyn was just doing, it's definitely it was worthwhile. Um, At GR two guys, yeah, Harvard GR two. Um, so, on a broader note, how GR two fits into the broader humanitarian field, I often you know am reminded when I work with our project partners. How incredibly all-consuming humanitarian response is. I see people giving all of themselves, working 22-hour days, seven days a week, and that's not even an exaggeration, just kind of head down, throwing their whole heart into this response. And that's so admirable, and it also means that a lot of times people don't have an opportunity to step back, to work with the data they're gathering, to um, ask questions that might be more generalizable, not only for their response, but beyond what can we learn from this that we could apply to other situations. And it's such a privilege to come in as someone who's supporting that effort um, with a slightly different lens, asking slightly different questions. Um, and you're maybe a bit more protected from the kind of exigency of the daily need. Um, and, you know, that has positive and negatives to it. You know, it's always so incredible to be the person handing out reintegration kits, but 
for our part, we try to support those people by um, asking the questions, collecting the information, doing some of the analyses that help them do their job better. Um, and as we see some of these big global trends like climate change and um, this incredible increasing awareness of um, women's roles and rights in so many of these contexts, it's wonderful for us to be able to track some of those like um, longer changes through many of our projects. And it's this through line that has been really exciting to see. That's incredible. And, and you mentioned kind of local partners a little bit. I wondered if you had anything more to share on that. I know that's one of our favorite things with the GR2 program is how closely we work with just phenomenal, you know, local collaborators. Yeah, it's the best part of our job. I mean, it's the joy and the kind of beating heart of the work is these collaborators, many of whom we've worked with for like 10 years, you know, that we are hand in hand with just, again, like following those trails of breadcrumbs, those through lines. So a lot of times we'll start working with a partner and have a project on the needs of, you know, for instance, survivors of violence. And then we realize how holistic the approach needs to be. So we'll advocate for individual and family counseling. And then we'll realize that um, beyond that, creating programs that also integrate income generation and um, do community sensitizations are really powerful. So we have a lot of examples of working with the same local partner for years and years and years on projects that kind of um, take us further in our understanding on a particular topic. Um, one of my favorite moments from this past trip was seeing Nicholas. So Nicholas and I worked together years and years ago. He's a pediatrician who also is a great researcher. And so he did some of our qualitative research with us. And I saw him this past trip as we moved into the quantitative phase. So he's one of our enumerators. But when I left um, Northern Congo years and years ago, we stayed in touch. And like every two weeks, um, Nicholas would send me photos first of what was a muddy hole in the ground. And then the muddy hole had like some bricks next to it and so on and so forth. And we kept communicating about this clinic that he decided to build out of his pocket, out of his own salary. It was his dream. And I watched this clinic grow up out of nothing, out of just Nicholas's kind of grit. And this past trip, I actually came and it's a full-fledged hospital where children are being born. And, um, in some ways, it was like a metaphor for being able to watch us and our partners and our projects grow up and change and become something different as time goes on. And so um, and these are the kind of people we work with, you know, yeah. this guy who uses his research salary to build a clinic. Um so what a privilege for us. And if you guys want to see the clinic, it's also on our Instagram account. So Jocelyn, tell me a little bit about um, what's kind of been going on with GR2 and, and your work since the, you know, the advent of this COVID-19 epidemic. Like everyone, you know, we were struck by how quickly the COVID epidemic took over the world. And I think that um, one of the most incredibly troubling things about it was wondering how it was going to impact our incredible collaborators, particularly in places like South Sudan, Central African Republic, and Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there's really poor healthcare infrastructure and not a lot of, um, you know, government engagement on being able to communicate around health issues. And so what we were feeling from a lot of our um, collaborators just like here in the U.S. is a lot of sense of anxiety, of uncertainty, and of not knowing how they were going to be impacted by this crisis. We also had some survey teams in the field. And so, of course, we were working every day with um, our, our partner organization in Bukavu in Eastern DRC to kind of pull back those teams and make sure that they were safe and healthy during this time. So it's definitely, um, especially in the first days and weeks, a sense of trying to adjust to a changing reality, but the real goal was to make sure that everyone was safe and healthy and that um, the work wasn't putting any of our collaborators at higher risk. Absolutely. And, you know, on top of that, it feels like there's also been a really strong, concerted push within the gender-based violence 
sector specifically in order to kind of raise alarm bells about how this crisis can exacerbate gender-based violence um, and domestic violence in particular. Um, And I want to draw our audience's attention to a really beautiful blog um, that you published a few weeks ago uh, titled An Emergency Inside an Emergency, How Quarantine Has Changed Life for Women in Italy. And I feel like this was kind of teeing up um, a lot of the aspects of what we would later see in the United States um, and in many other countries. But could you talk to me a little bit about this blog and why you felt it was important to kind of write about this topic? Yeah, definitely. So I had this like incredible privilege of reaching out to these women who are Italian academics and thinkers and, um, you know, human rights advocates and domestic violence advocates who had been in quarantine for almost four weeks by the time I talked to them. And um, these women who were doing childcare and continuing to advocate for these incredible issues and continuing to run helplines and make videos to support survivors of domestic violence all made the time to sit down and kind of reflect on what this pandemic had meant for them personally and for the issues that they were working on. And it was such a humbling and wonderful experience. And um, these women were such champions in their own ways. And what they highlighted were these multidimensional kind of aspects of COVID and how it affected women in Italy, because as you might remember, that was one of the first places deeply affected by the quarantine um, in Europe in particular. And it was almost a case study for understanding how other countries might be affected by the epidemic. Women highlighted a lot of really fascinating issues. And certainly one was the increase in domestic violence for um, people who were cloistered together. So um, now there's been an increasing awareness and we've seen a lot of stories in places like the New York Times and other news outlets that acknowledge domestic violence as what has been called the shadow epidemic. So across the globe and in many countries, including the U.S., we know that the rates of intimate partner violence and violence against children are increasing because COVID is exacerbating all of these factors that can feed into this. And that's confinement, social isolation, increased levels of emotional and financial stress, and sometimes weak institutional responses. And when women and children are confined with a perpetrator in quarantine, you know, reporting on telephone helplines or getting um, support may not be the safest option for them. So while we may see the rates of violence going up, we often see reporting plummeting. And that was something the women in this blog really highlighted. Um, What was really exciting, though, to hear from these women and from other contexts is there are all of these incredible, creative ways that um, women and care providers are finding to reach out to survivors and victims of domestic violence to let them know that they're not alone. So in Italy, um, one woman described that they had switched from telephone based support, which can be overheard if you're in the same house as someone, to text-based messaging with really innocuous interfaces so you would never know that someone's seeking support for domestic violence. And these women were also creating these videos to just say, like, we see you, you're not alone, we know you can't reach out, but we're thinking of you and our hearts are with you. And that was really powerful as well. Um, In France, I'm sure many of you guys have heard of these remarkable um, innovations that they're coming up with, but Pharmacies all over the country in France have been designated as places for women who can go into a pharmacy and speak in code to ask for help um, with domestic violence. They ask, I think, for a mask 19. um, And that's a way for the pharmacist to know that that woman is seeking help. And they also have these pop up counseling centers in hotels and in supermarkets for women. So one of the things that we're learning is that um, people aren't giving up on this issue and the outreach is getting smarter and more creative and more innovative. And I think that's a model that we can carry forward even after the COVID epidemic. You know, I think we're learning a lot and we're innovating a lot as we go. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been really encouraging, I think, as you've alluded to, to just see, you know, this being taken seriously at higher levels in mainstream media um, and have being able to see what different countries are doing to kind of respond to this uh, current exacerbation. Um, I think one of the things we know, though, working on this full time, is that this is kind of an always thing. And I wanted to ask a little bit 
about the impact of COVID on current or, you know, GBV programming that was already in place and already, you know, quite essential and critical in either fragile contexts or refugee camps. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about the COVID disruption and where you see that work kind of moving forward. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think one of the most powerful messages that this is bringing up is that this is an opportunity to walk with um, local partners in conflict-affected places to um, keep our ears open and maybe um, our mouths closed and to think about um, how we understand how our partners are experiencing this epidemic and how we can provide the support that they request. Um, and, you know, this is an opportunity, I think, to advance what we call in the humanitarian field, the localization agenda, which is to really, truly listen to the people who are experts in their own issues, who are the local communities affected by conflict and crisis, and to respond to the requests that they make for, for their own needs. Um, I also think that, you know, one of the things that we're very sadly going to see is a peak of the pandemic hitting the most fragile and crisis affected places, which happily is not something that we've seen as clearly now, but I think it will be an inevitable peak in the epidemic. So globally, there are 126 million people in need of humanitarian assistance and 70 million forcibly displaced. So, so far, 79 of the 185 mm -hmm. countries reporting COVID are refugee hosting countries. And in places like Italy, which we were talking about before, we really happily didn't see um, the disease peak and really crowded refugee conditions. But I do think it will be inevitable as um, the disease progresses. And, you know, like any health problem or complex issue, COVID highlights and exacerbates all of the existing inequalities that are already there. So, you know, many of the countries in the midst of armed conflict, like DRC, where we work most often, have seen huge damage to critical healthcare infrastructure in the past. And um, that means that their capacity to detect, to test, to treat cases of COVID are almost non-existent. And um, as we can all imagine, refugee settings are characterized um, by crowding and limited access to sanitation services, which are some of the hugest risk factors for disease spread. And, you know, one of the things that we work on a lot at HHI is acknowledging that it's not just formal refugee settlements, but informal settlements like favelas or um, urban slums that face a lot of these issues that are receiving areas for refugees. And that's going to be a huge issue going forward. Um, one of the things I think you and I have talked about a bit, Meredith, is that even amongst our own project partners, in places affected by um, conflict, there can be a sense of um, mistrust of information coming from the state. And one of the things that we see is just a real dearth of accurate, reliable and timely information that people have access to in places with really poor infrastructure. So um, we're seeing a lot of confusion about where to get good information about COVID prevention and response. And this kind of misinformation not only leads to poor health outcomes, but can also lead to the stigmatization of those suspected of having COVID. And we didn't see, you know, nowhere is the harmful effect of that kind of stigma more evident than in a place like DRC that had um, the Ebola response. And there we saw that poor communication and ineffective trust building by the state around a health issue led to these incredibly severe and um, horrific attacks on health care workers or people suspected of being ill. And it should never be the case that those who put their lives on the line for um you know, healthcare provision also have to face the risk of personal violence. So we see a lot of kind of multi-layered issues that bring in gender, that bring in um, fragile states and bring in this sense of, um, you know, how we're looking at the existing challenges in fragile states then being exacerbated by this disease. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a, a microcosm or that would be the opposite word I'm looking for, um, of a lot of the issues that we have discussed over the years, you're really seeing that become global. Um, I wanted to ask, given kind of the reach of this pandemic um, and the fact that domestic violence is being highlighted as a concern, um, domestic violence, IPV, GBV, across a host of countries, not only 
ones who were previously experiencing humanitarian crisis. What are you hopeful about in terms of lessons that we might be learning now that we can integrate into future responses or future programming? It's such a good question. I think one of the things that I've seen that has been so um, heartwarming and inspiring is that local peace builders, local female leaders, community activists have these um, have always had this incredible capacity and really unique capacity to bridge um, messages between states or the international community and their local communities, that they're able to build these remarkable networks of trust and information sharing, and that, um, you know, these trust brokers who are these activist women's leaders in local communities have an incredible opportunity to step forward and to um, play an increasing leadership role in this time. And I think the to the extent that we as an international community can acknowledge and amplify that trend will be all to the good. And, you know, at a time when we can't rush to the scene of a need, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen kids play um, soccer, but there's this kind of swarming yeah, effect of where the ball goes and everyone kind of swarms over and everyone wants to be where the ball is. And the truth is, and to some extent, and often to the good, we do that as a humanitarian community where um, a crisis happens um, and there's a swarming effect. And it's one of the first times ever that we will not be able to physically be in the places where we see the greatest need. And that's changing the entire humanitarian system and turning it on its head. And what we need to do to respond to that is to empower um, these incredible local partners to give them what they're asking for, to give them the skills, the material, the technology, um, the goods that they need to be, um, you know, the change makers they already are and to, you know, walk with them from a distance. And that's something I don't think the humanitarian community has ever done before to this extent. No, that's incredible. Um, it sounds like we have a lot of really amazing opportunities coming down the line, you know, despite some of the really strong uh, and very real challenges that we're facing. Um, Jocelyn, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me on the line today and kind of doing a little addendum to our previously recorded podcast. It's such a pleasure, Meredith. And we had so much fun creating the first version of the podcast. And I know, you know, in some ways the world has turned upside down till then, but it still feels incredible to connect. And it's so nice to hear your voice from, from afar. Um, so I'm really glad we had a chance to have the conversation. Once again, that was Dr. Jocelyn Kelly, the director of the Program on Gender, Rights, and Resilience at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. That concludes this episode of the Humanitarian Assistance Podcast. If you liked our conversation today, you can continue to learn more about the GR2 program and view exclusive behind-the-scenes content by following us at HarvardGR2, all one word, on both Instagram and Twitter. Until then, I'm Meredith Blake, and on behalf of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, Thanks so much for listening.